Awesome. Thank you, everybody. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here today at our last seminar for the academic year. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffitt. I'm the research program manager here at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, we've got some new faces in the room. So just a reminder, this is a hybrid event. So that means we have folks online and folks in the room. Uh, for folks in the room, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll bring you this mic and you can ask your question of our presenter. That way the folks online can hear your questions as well. For folks that are um, online, if you put in your questions into the chat box, um, as I mentioned, Roseanne will be monitoring that chat box and she will read the questions out to our presenter as you can get your questions answered. Um, but again, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I've got a couple of just quick announcements. We've got a lot of things going on here in the next week or so. Um, so just a reminder, after the Juneteenth holiday on June 20th, we're gonna have our next Science on Tap, where we have DLCD staff coming to talk to us about changes in Oregon beaches and dunes and the relationship with the land use planning goal 18 and the changes in that goal. So that should be a really interesting talk. Earlier that day, we'll have an uh, invited guest from MMI. Oh, I'm gonna forget how to pronounce his name. I'm looking at Roseanne Warzig. Hang on. Berndt Versig. Um, and so he will be here at 11 um, to present uh, in this room. So if you're interested in learning more about marine mammals and uh, human interactions, I think that that will be a really interesting talk. Um, also wanted to remind folks that we have our Markham Symposium on June 22nd from two to five also in this room. Our Markham Symposium celebrates all of our graduate students who have received awards to support their research. So that should be a really interesting event. If you're interested in any of our events here at Hatfield and you'd like to learn more, you can go to the HMSC website, go to the events page, and all of the information about how to log in or come in person um, will be on that page. Also wanted to remind folks that we are recording today's event, so if there's others that weren't able to join us, you can find that information on our past seminar page. But why you're all here today is actually for today's speaker. Um, so let me just do a quick introduction of Emily. Um, Emily is an assistant professor with Oregon State University's Coastal Effluvial um, Sediment Dynamics Lab. She has two bachelors from the University of Alaska, one in civil engineering and one in geologic sciences, and her master's and PhD from the University of Washington in oceanography. After completing her degrees, Emily worked as a postdoc at the University of Oregon and then was an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, before coming to OSU in 2022. She grew up in Eagle River, Alaska, um, surrounded by a landscape of glaciers and interesting sediment processes. And so she kind of took that love and put it into her work. Um, most of her work is centered around the Arctic and the subarctic. And so she's going to talk to us today about some of that work. So we're excited to have her here. So Emily? Go ahead and make it go green and the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Well, thanks all for coming for the last seminar of the term before you start your summers. Um, I'm gonna talk about something a little less summer-like. We're gonna talk about the Arctic, very cold place. Uh, and these photos are some of my favorite sentinel images from the study site um, that I'm mostly gonna talk about in the second part of the talk, which is Harrison Bay, um, which is up on the north coast of Alaska. Uh, let's see. Um, so Cinnamon gave a, a lovely intro. Um, as she said, I'm from South Central Alaska, um, went to University of Alaska Anchorage, and um, I'm really delighted to be here working at OSU now and doing research um, up on the North Slope and other parts of Alaska. Uh, it was something I always wanted to do when I was a student in Alaska. I just had to leave the state at some point to pursue higher education opportunities to go back and do this research. Um, but I really like working on coastal systems because it kind of combines all the things um, that I've been doing over the last 15 years or so, which is uh, working in small communities in Alaska. I was a, an intern for a while in engineering, working on um, small utility projects in rural Alaska. It combines sedimentology and geology that I did as an undergrad. It combines the oceanography that I did in grad school. Um, and it keeps me close to the, close to the coast uh, where I grew up. So it's been a lot of fun. So my overarching research questions in my lab are where is sediment going and what is driving it there? Um, and also how can we develop better, and I would argue better often means cheaper, tools to track this. 
Um, and we also look at what rates it deposits at and accumulates at over time scales of seasons to a century. So we're really looking at sediment transport processes. Sometimes we actually do this in rivers all the way out to the continental shelf and slope. And then we're trying to link those processes and transport rates to what the actual geologic record on the seabed. So we use a lot of diverse tools ranging from traditional oceanographic methods like moorings. We use laser particle sizers, um, but we also link that to geochronology. So we do a lot of isotope work. And my homework in a couple of weeks is to go back to the lab and set up a new alpha system so that we can do more of that um, isotope work. So I work in a variety of systems ranging from rivers to estuaries like Coos Bay out to the continental shelf. But today I'm really going to be focusing on continental shelf environments. And we have some classic paradigms for how sediment uh, is transported across and deposited on continental shelves. And that includes active margins like we have here in the West Coast. Uh, these are primarily fed sediment from rivers, which are by far the largest source, but also coastal bluff erosion, um, which you're aware of here in Newport. That sediment is often transported across the shelf um, gradually or rapidly by waves and currents. So waves can resuspend material and it can diffuse downslope. It can be advected by currents. Sometimes it travels down as high concentration gravity flows. On contrasting passive margins like North Carolina, where I was for a few years, those shelves tend to be a lot sandier and less muddy. There's less mud coming in. Their mountains are smaller, their rivers are smaller. And a lot of that mud is trapped in very large um, shallow lagoons and estuaries and it doesn't reach the shelf. So these are kind of our two mental models um, of continental shelf sedimentation in different environments. But if you go to the Arctic, the Arctic is very different. We have a lot of passive margins. We also have a lot of very wide shelves. About 20% of global shelf area is actually found in the Arctic. A lot of that is uh, encompassed in the Siberian shelf, but we have shelves fringing all the other parts as well. There are large rivers discharging to the Arctic. They have very seasonal uh, delivery of water and sediment. Um, and then we have sea ice. So sea ice covers our continental shelves for up to nine months per year, limiting the transport processes that we would normally see in temperate systems. <clears throat> Shorelines are also eroding very rapidly in the Arctic. There's a lot of permafrost. That's a relic feature of the last glacial maximum when large parts of uh, North America and Siberia were dry and arid. They actually weren't covered by ice. There was a lot of permafrost that developed, um, a lot of ice wedge polygons developed. And now when those come in contact with warm ocean water in the summer, those coastlines erode very rapidly as a result. So in the Arctic, sometimes coastal erosion actually is a bigger source of sediment than rivers. So we have these two interesting sources. But all these things are changing. So the sea ice is changing. We know that we've lost most of the multi-year sea ice. Um, the seasonal extents each year are getting smaller and smaller. If you work in the Arctic, you're probably used to seeing graphs like this. They have sort of the long-term average of sea ice extent, and then every year the red line is lower and lower. Um, and that's leading to changes in the wave climate. So there's a lot of different models that have looked at how the wave climate is going to change because as we lose the sea ice, the fetch increases. Um, and you also have a longer season in which wind can generate waves. So you have a longer period of wave energy and you're developing larger waves because of that increased fetch. Some models like this model from Barnhart in 2015 even suggest that by 2100, we might see 365 days of open water per year um, on the Alaskan Arctic coast. So that would be a big shift from what we presently see and that would impact the geology. Rivers are also changing. Uh, this is a recent study um, by a colleague who compiled a lot of remote sensing data and was able to look at long-term trends. And in general, major Arctic rivers are seeing increasing discharge. And the timing of that discharge is changing, not only for the rivers, but also relative to when there is sea ice on the ocean. So we have all these complex feedbacks and interrelated dynamics of increased river delivery, shifting timing of sediment into the coastal ocean, and then a prolonged period of time when waves and currents can act on that material. Coastal erosion um, was high and is accelerating. This is a very well-cited USGS data set um, that shows that parts of the Alaska coastline are eroding at rates of, um, in some places, over 10 meters per year. That's not unusual for soft sediment coastlines in the Arctic. So that's pretty much much of Alaska, much of Siberia, and a few other locations as well. Um, this is an example uh, just dramatizing that shoreline erosion from Cape Halkett. This is on the northern Alaska coast. Um, and we have a really nice uh, high-res plane image, um, thanks to surveillance done during the Cold War from 1960, and we're able to compare that to some new Google Earth imagery, and we can see several hundred meters of shoreline retreat on the south side of the Cape, where it's sheltered from waves, 
and up to a kilometer of retreat on that coastal headland. So this is changing how sediment is getting routed into the coastal ocean. So we have a lot of questions about how these environmental changes impact sediment dynamics and the deposits that we see on continental shelves. And you know, we could talk for a long time about all the implications of this related to seabed and infrastructure stability, nutrient transport, carbon storage, various hazards. Um, and that would be well and good, but we kind of have to rewind a little bit and realize that we don't really know what the present sediment dynamics are. It's really hard to tell what they're going to be 20 or 50 years in the future because we have a very limited understanding um, of how these systems work now, especially relative to temperate shelves. And there's a caveat to that, which is that in the 70s, Alaska saw a big construction boom for the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System that connected Prudhoe Bay on the Beaufort Sea down to the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and there was a lot of good marine geology that was done during that period, especially by a team of USGS researchers who went out and made a lot of rich uh, sets of very qualitative and very excellent observations. So they learned a lot about how sediment interacts with sea ice, they made maps, um, but there hasn't been a lot that's been done since then. And we have a lot of new tools now and better ways to track where sediment's going. We have better ways of instrumenting in the winter time. Um, and this was in the 80s and things have changed. That was 40 years ago and we have a lot less sea ice now. So I wanna take you on a tour today of two different coastal environments um, in Northwest Alaska. The first one is Icy Cape. Um, and I should emphasize, these are all passive margin systems. So if we're thinking back to passive and active margins, but Icy Cape um, is actually somewhat reminiscent of sort of East Coast Atlantic margin systems like North Carolina. Harrison Bay is a lot muddier. And to me, it's a little bit more reminiscent of the shelf offshore of Oregon um, even though it's not an active margin setting. So I've been working on an NSF project with some colleagues from UW, Virginia Tech, um, and Utrecht for the last few years. And uh, the first part of the study happened in 2019 and 2020, and it was done in conjunction with UW, and we got some preliminary data at Icy Cape and some, a little bit of data in Harrison Bay. Um, 2019 was great, we just got this project funded, Everything was awesome. We went out with this huge team of, of people. Um, I started hiring students and then the pandemic happened. All of our field work got canceled the next year for our main project. Um, and I was able to team up with Jim Thompson and we went on a uh, cruise on the Sekuliak with a science party of four um, and sailed all the way from Seward up to the Beaufort Sea and we were able to recover some moorings and get some measurements. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of the icy cape work that came out of that, those two surveys. Um, and then in 2021 and 2022, we chartered with the Ukpik, which is based out of Dead Horse. Um, and we went and did some pretty exhaustive surveys in Harrison Bay. Uh, we collected a very rich data set on seabed features, water columns, sediment transport processes, coastal hydrodynamics, um, as well as a rich geotech data set, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, but it's pretty cool. So Icy Cape. Um, it's a pretty interesting site. It is the southernmost in a series of three cuspate headlands in northwestern Alaska. Um, there was an early researcher in the 70s who called this the longest, straightest, most impressive chain of barrier islands in Alaska. Um, this is a pretty sandy and gravelly system. And I'm always kind of excited to look at this map because they look remarkably like the capes that we see in North Carolina. So they have about the same spacing of about 100 kilometers, about the same prominence from shore. Um, they're both composed of sand and gravel uh, barriers. And in North Carolina, um, there's been a debate running for about 50 years of how exactly those capes have formed. Um, and the, the newest paper and the paper that I personally like the best is a modeling paper, which suggests that if you take a straight shoreline and impose two contrasting wave directions on it, you can actually generate those headlands um, just spontaneously from small perturbations. So it's possible that these are formed entirely by wave-driven wave longshore transport dynamics. So we were able to go um, and conduct a pretty extensive survey of Icy Cape. Offshore of Icy Cape subtitally, there's an impressive shoal complex called Blossom Shoals, site of a couple shipwrecks in the 1800s from the whaling community. Overall, not a lot of traffic here though, um, but these shoal features are impressive. They have relief of up to on the scale of 10 to 20 meters. They're spaced a few hundred meters apart. And this is actually rasterized bathymetry that Steve Roberts on Sekuliak made for us. And this is from 1950s NOAA data, which is the latest, greatest um, bathymetry data available for navigation. 
Um, and then superimposed on that is a little bit of shoreline change data. Northwestern Alaska on the Chukchi, those coastlines are actually relatively stable compared to the ones on the Beaufort Sea. Um, they have fairly modest retreat rates and the retreat rates you're seeing are really more an expression of longshore transport and translation rather than landward retreat. So a fairly stable coastline. We collected a lot of seabed sediment measurements and proved ourselves that the shoals are very sandy. There are some isolated pockets of mud near shore. Um, there's a rich sand dollar community there. I've heard there are clams uh, elsewhere closer to the Bering Strait, but for some reason, this is a pretty sand dollar rich environment. Um, and in the multi-beam, we were able to go and look at these small scale ripples. So these are about a meter high. They're spaced about 20 to 30 meters apart. Um, and what's interesting is we collected data uh, in November of one year and October of the next year. And if you go early enough in the open water season, early being October, you can see evidence of ice keel scours in those rippled sediments from the previous winter. But if you go later, as the storm season has picked up, those get washed out. Uh, so that suggests that sand transport is very active in the system. This isn't sort of a relic system that has shut off. Things are pretty mobile here. Uh, and this is what USGS folks in the 80s had also concluded. They, they saw similar ripple patterns and from the asymmetry of the ripples and the shoals, they, they sort of inferred these transport directions. And it's a little bit satisfying to see that there should be a convergence of sand leading to offshore transport, which suggests that there's some mechanism for formation and maintenance of these shoals um, through active sand movement. So Jim Thompson had a mooring out at this S1A site in about 30 meters of water. That was out for almost a full year, and we were able to use that to look at uh, transport dynamics. So what I did here was I just took the currents, um, both during the open water season and under ice season, um, and then the wave data during the open water season, and use those to compute bed stresses. Um, and I've, I've got a paper in review now. It has a lot of uh, details about the equations that we chose for that. Um, there were a lot of decisions to make in terms of what equations. I won't show those today, but I think these are reasonable estimates of those bed stresses. Um, when you sum those up over the full year, you can sum up the cumulative hours when the critical bed stress for sand is exceeded by either waves or currents. Um, and over a full year, a year is about 8,700 hours, those sands should only be mobile at 30 meters water depth for about 400 to 600 hours. So it's a pretty small fraction of the year, but they should be mobile. Given that, we had kind of expected that the shoals might be changing or they might have changed since the 50s. So 70 years of diminishing sea ice, increasing waves, we've definitely got some mobility potential. Uh, but when we compared the rasterized NOAA bathy from the 50s with some small boat bathymetry that we collected um, together with Sukuliak, we found that these shoals really haven't changed in 70 years. That was actually a little bit surprising. So this seems like a system where even though we're losing sea ice and the waves are growing, we're not really seeing a coastal morphologic response, um, at least not yet. They're pretty stable. So I was curious to think about what sort of trends have been happening over the last 70 years and if we would expect there to be some morphologic change. So I grabbed the era five hindcast analysis um, going back to the 50s. The older data is of somewhat dubious quality, but at least it's a starting place. Um, and we're seeing trends in open water days per year. We're seeing increasing trends in wave height and period that I've not shown here. Um, and that's leading to very small increases in our mean wave driven bed stresses. Um, and it's leading to an increase in hours when the wave stress exceeds the critical stress. Unfortunately, we can't add currents into this. We don't have a good hindcast for currents. But just based on waves, um, we're seeing an increasing trend. But overall, they're only causing an increase in mobility of about 2% of the total duration of each year. So it's actually pretty subtle at this point. Another complicating factor is that we often have land fast ice um, within a couple kilometers of shore that can form early in the fall and break up late in the winter. So that provides extra protection. So that might be one reason why we're seeing so little change, especially in those very shallow areas. Okay, so I'm gonna shift and go around the corner and go look at Harrison Bay on the Beaufort Shelf, which is our much muddier system. Uh, the shelf here is very shallow. So our slope break offshore of Oregon is somewhere on the order of about 130 meters. But in Northern Alaska, it's only about 40 to 70 meters. Uh, it's about a 60 to 100 kilometer wide shelf. It's not super wide as global shelves go, but it's pretty decent. So we have this nice shallow flat platform. Um, 
even though it has sea ice much of the year, it seems like maybe there should be some wave driven transport here in the summer. So we embarked on this study and we were trying to answer some pretty basic questions. Again, there's not a lot of research that's been done on this area for quite some time. So we just wanted to know dominant transport directions and major deposition sites. For example, is sediment making it all the way to the slope break or not? Is it getting trapped in the nearshore zones? Is it traveling across shelf or is it traveling in an, a long shelf uh, transport pathway? It has a lot of implications for nutrients, carbon, seabed change. And then we also had some bigger picture questions of how the morphology of the shelf could change given a more energetic future wave climate, which was something we assessed through modeling. So our first step was to go out and do a lot of multi-beam bathymetry. Um, and the multi-beam there never gets old because pretty much the entire shelf is uh, scarred by all of these keel scours. So all the features that you're seeing here uh, are on the order of about five to 40 meters wide and one to even two meters deep. Uh, you can see that there are some really interesting patterns. They don't all go in the same direction. Some of them uh, make right angles, which is pretty odd in the ocean. Um, and they're everywhere from about the 10 to 20 meter isobath all the way out to the slope break. So these are formed by big ice keels, big pressure ridges that form. Uh, in the upper right, that's a nice um, radar image that was delivered to us while we were on a cruise on Sukuliak. And this was in November, and you can see that in the upper right, that big pink zone, that's all the pack ice that's growing offshore in the wintertime in the fall. But then near shore, you see a little band of color right next to the coast, and that's all the land fast ice that's also growing at the same time. So eventually that offshore ice will grow farther south and the land fast ice will grow a little bit north. And those two different types of ice um, will collide. The land fast ice tends to be one to two meters thick. Pack ice can be up to three to four meters thick. And there's a lot of force moving that ice. It's being acted on by wind. And so wherever it collides, you get this big train wreck and this big ridge that forms, um, which can make travel in the Arctic kind of difficult for you know, people on snow machines ranging up to icebreakers. Um, these pressure ridges are a big deal. The pressure ridges have a large keel below them. Um, it's kind of like an iceberg. Usually that keel is much, much taller than the surface expression. And those keels scour the seabed and cause these keel scours as they're known. And a lot of that happens uh, in what has been called the Stamuki zone. It's one of my favorite Arctic words. And that usually is found between about 20 and 40 meters water depth. So that's where you tend to have this meeting of the land fast and the pack ice. Um, and since our shelf break is at about 40 to 70 meters water depth, that means that a very large portion of our shelf um, tends to be impacted by these. Um, and in fact, all of Northwestern Alaska lost most of their internet a couple of days ago because there was a new-ish fiber cable offshore of Aliktok Point, sort of in the middle of that coastline map, um, and it severed the fiber cable. So they're struggling with low internet. So ice keels are a big deal. The sediments on the shelf reflect that ice scouring. They're very mixed. It's very difficult to construct any sort of pattern map. It's very difficult to relate sediment size or type to water depth. Um, everything's kind of a mess out there. It's thought that those ice keels don't actually accomplish a lot of lateral displacement. It's kind of like plowing a field. They just sort of plow sediment up around them and they form furrows and ridges on the sides. And on those ridges, we often find uh, little mud clumps or mud balls that are kind of reminiscent of dredge spoils. So you plow up the sediment and the mud rolls down and it forms all these little clasps. So it's a very distinct um, sediment fabric. We see some anoxic sediments. Um, we'll go to sites and we'll find well sorted sand and then we'll sample again at the same site and we'll find mixed mud and sand and mud clasps. So it's very irregular sediment. Um, and the, the geotech team, it was kind of driving them nuts because they would try to get repeatability of their measurements. and. You, you drop the device 10 times and you get 10 completely different profiles because everything's so um, mixed out there. The only thing that was a little bit consistent was um, in the short gravity cores that we took and in a lot of the grab samples, we noticed that there was this one to two centimeter thick uh, layer of very loose unconsolidated sort of fluffy mud uh, on top of everything else, it has a lot of organics in it. And we tried to date that for short-lived isotopes to see if we could detect a terrestrial source from that spring, but everything was isotopically dead, which doesn't tell us anything. Um, it means that you could have fresh sediment coming in from the rivers, but maybe it's eroding out of a bluff or it's scoured from the riverbed, or maybe this is bluff sediment, or maybe it's really old sediment that's been on the shelf for a while. 
I think it probably represents a suspension deposit of sediment that's settling out from very weak river plumes under the ice during some seasons, um, but we're still not really sure how that forms. It's pretty ubiquitous though. So next I wanna show you some results of transport pathways that we got from uh, mooring records. So we put out some very tiny coastal moorings to measure currents, measure turbidity, measure wave properties. Um, and we tried to pick two sites. So we've got one on the east, we've got a transect on the east side of the bay, basically right off the Colville River mouth. And then we've got a transect on the west over by Cape Halkett where it's exposed to a bit more wave energy. And I'm gonna focus first on uh, site T1B I'll show, most of the data I'm gonna show is from that site, um, but I'll also show you a little bit from uh, T2B as well. And then I've got some supporting sensors from other sites. So the top plot in my huge uh, lined up time series plots, which we love in coastal sediment transport, top plot is wind uh, direction in degrees from north and the wind speed. Um, and unfortunately this wind data is from Prudhoe Bay. So it's not that close, but it's kind of the best that we have without deploying our own weather station on shore near the study site. Uh, and you'll notice that there's a couple of big wave events or a couple of big wind events of up to 15 meters per second. And the wind directions typically vary from, they're either about 90 degrees or about 270 degrees. So we've either got wind coming from the east or wind coming from the west. It tends to be pretty bimodal in the direction. The second plot is a plot of the water level variation at the moorings. It's kind of hard to see on that plot, but I've actually put in the data from all three moorings. Um, but it's kind of nice because we can see how that wind is causing set up or set down at the coast. So we're either piling water up near shore or we're pulling it away from shore. Um, and in this system, uh, the tides are microtidal. So the wind driven and water level differences actually tend to, in many cases, they're more important. Um, the magnitude is greater than what you see from the tides. So uh, the last two plots, these are the east velocity um, and the north velocity, and because of this nice north-south transect, the east velocity is basically the alongshore water velocity, and the north velocity is the across shore. Uh, so you can see that in the surface waters, the alongshore velocities dominate. That makes sense. They're forced by wind. And our across shore velocities tend to be much smaller in the upper water column, although they're only a little bit smaller uh, near the bed. Both of these are near bed plots. Sorry, the bottom of the plot is 0.9 meters above. So if we zoom in on a couple of different types of events, um, first I've highlighted basically the big red periods um, in the east velocity plot. So these are times when the water is flowing to the west because we have winds from the east. Um, and in these cases, we end up with near bed currents that are actually flowing southwestward. And this is kind of cool because we're actually getting some uh, potential landward transport of sediment during those periods of time. There are contrasting periods when we have winds from the west. Uh, in this case, we get surface currents flowing east. That makes sense. And we get near bed currents that are pretty weak or they're flowing with some offshore component. And this is, we were expecting to see more of this because we see a lot of mud on the outer shelf. So we thought that there was some mechanism for getting mud out there. If we change this plot a little bit, now I've added the waves, uh, significant wave heights and the turbidity on the bottom two plots. Um, the significant wave height is actually from the most offshore mooring, T1C, but we know that those waves are propagating across the shelf. And the turbidity is at T1A, the most inshore site. And I chose to show that just because there's a very strong turbidity gradient between the A, B, and C sites. Um, so your turbidity at the B and C sites tends to be an order of magnitude lower than what you see at the A sites. So that's interesting too. There's a lot of sediment that's retained close to shore. Um, so in this plot, we see that there are actually times when we see high turbidity peaks in the absence of waves. Uh, and these correspond to some of those periods when we have some wind from the west, we have some possibly stronger currents near bed. We don't have a lot of waves though. So it's kind of interesting that you can generate a pretty good turbidity signal just with those wind driven currents in the system. But then when we turn on the waves, when we have those winds coming in from the east, um, we can also generate those suspended sediment signals. And we know that we're gonna have different transport directions for those two peaks in turbidity. So the first one is gonna be traveling northeast and a little bit offshore. Second one is gonna be traveling southwest and a little bit onshore. And in this case, our turbidity signal was actually greater when we had currents, but no waves. Typically though, we would expect to see it be greater uh, with waves. So this was kind of an interesting signal. 
So to contrast with that, I just want to show the results from T2B um, very quickly. So we've got the same types of plots. We only have velocity data from the lower water column for technical instrument reasons. Um, and again, here you see that we have a peak contributivity that's not associated uh, with a strong wave event. Um, but in this case, that actually coincided with winds coming from the east. So that material is going to be moving uh, southwestward and a little bit onshore. And then we saw another peak in waves uh, that generated strong turbidity. And again, that's going to be moving southwest and a little bit onshore. So if we put this together, when we have east winds and waves, um, which is fairly common, we see some resuspension at both sites, and we see some southwestward transport with landward component. Um, and that's pretty cool because, again, in a lot of our paradigms of continental shelf sediments, we know that currents impart direction, but waves are often what pick material up off the bed. That's in systems that are a little more tidally dominated, though. In this system, uh, our waves tend to come when we have winds from the northeast. Uh, and during those periods, you're kind of optimized to be driving sediment mostly along the shelf, but actually a little bit towards shore. When you have west winds, you're gonna get that northeastward transport. So in this case, even though we don't have strong tides here, our wind-driven currents can actually be enough to accomplish resuspension and transport, even if we don't have waves. So whether that lack of waves is just because the fetch isn't optimal and you've got shielding from this headland or because of some other property, um, you can have sediment traveling in that direction as well. And that's probably gonna be the case when you're favoring a little bit of offshore transport. So if you're trying to think about seaward fluxes of nutrients out to the slope, you would want to think about that balance of the west winds versus the east winds with waves. So we're starting to get at some of our key questions. Um, a long shelf transport is key. We know that from the wind patterns. We know that from the very strong gradients uh, in turbidity. They're about an order of magnitude higher at those inshore sites than the two offshore sites. And it's kind of interesting to think that the landward sediment flux is actually pretty important in this system. Um, it suggests that a lot of that material is going to have a long residence time on the inner shelf, which means it has a lot of potential to be traveling um, along the shelf rather than getting flexed offshore over the continental slope. Um, in some uh, systems like the Oregon coast, occasionally you can have strong enough waves to generate gravity currents. Those can transport sediment across the shelf very quickly. And given the amount of mud on the outer shelf here, I was kind of wondering if that might be a mechanism. We didn't see evidence of that in this open water study, but we do know that the biggest storm energy comes in the fall. That's a time that's really hard to measure. Um, a lot of the research vessels are out of the water by then, and there's sea ice forming, it's hazardous to instruments, uh, but we're building really cheap sensors now. Most turbidity sensors are started about $3,000. We're building them for about 30 bucks now, and we can put a $200 iridium module on them and transmit data. So we're thinking about trying to build little drifters that we can put out in the coastal zone during those storm seasons to try to capture those dynamics. So this is kind of a snapshot of what transport pathways look like um, during our mooring period, which was about four weeks long, which is a pr actually a pretty large part of the open water season, but certainly not all of it. Um, and the conclusions we're forming are based on this distribution. So this is the a scatter plot of wind speeds versus wind directions just for that four week time series that I just showed. Uh, you see that by modality, you can see that we have a lot of winds from the east. Uh, those tend to be the stronger winds and those come with waves, presumably those drive stronger currents. And then we've got some winds from the west. If we expand that out to about the whole open water season, uh, so about late July through mid-October, um, you can see that you actually tend to have even more of those east wind events. And those are the events that are important for um, transporting things to the west. So that signal would probably be amplified over what we observed if you were able to measure for the whole period. There's also some stronger events, uh, stronger wind speeds in there that we didn't measure representing the fall storm season. In the future, if you have no sea ice during the year and you assume that your wind patterns stay the same, which I'm sure they won't, um, but if you expand that out to the whole year, and I've, I've downsampled here randomly just to show some of the points, um, it's kind of just an amplification of the effect we see in the middle panel. So you've got some stronger wind events that we're not capturing because those happen during ice covered seasons. Um, and you've got a lot of those winds from the east that dominate the system. Um, so sort of my hand wavy prediction here is uh, as you increase the length of your open water season and as you increase the wave climate a bit, that westward transport is probably going to become increasingly important. Um, and you won't necessarily flex more material offshore unless you can 
have enough wave energy to form wave supported gravity currents because oddly in the system, those wind driven currents um, paired with those waves that come with the east winds actually favor some landward transport. So it seems like you're going to keep a lot of things near shore. So before I close out, I wanted to briefly mention some related studies that we're doing. I wanted to dig into the morning data a little bit and focus on that. Um, but we've been doing a lot of other work. And, and this is related. This was my first master's student, John Melito. He now has a really cool coastal modeling job at the Texas Bureau of Economic Geology. And John spent a couple of years uh, spinning up a Delft 3D morphodynamic model um, to look at how the shelf might respond to waves over long time scales. So he ran this uh, for about 6,000 years. And he picked two transects. One was uh, in our Harrison Bay region over on the west side of the Beaufort Shelf, and the other was near um, Flaxman Islands over on the east side. And these are two pretty different sections of shelf. So again, Harrison Bay is very broad. It has a very low gradient. Uh, the Flaxman Island transect, uh, the shelf is much narrower there, and it's um, substantially steeper. So he imposed RCP 8.5 waves on these, and he took away all the sea ice. So basically, he opened up the open water season to 12 months per year. Interestingly, in Harrison Bay, that didn't really matter for how much wave energy reaches the shore. That shelf is already so broad and so flat, the waves are feeling a lot of friction, and you're attenuating a lot of that wave energy before it reaches the coastline. So if you turn up the waves in Harrison Bay and you take away all the sea ice, your coastal erosion will probably increase, but not necessarily because of more mechanical action from waves. It'll probably just be more of a thermal effect from rising water temperatures. Um, over on Flaxman Island, we see a different effect. So if you take away the ice and crank up the waves, you do see accelerated coastal erosion. You are seeing an increase in wave power at the shore, but you're adding material to your shelf and you form a larger mid-shelf sediment deposit that actually serves as a little bit of a negative feedback. So it actually slows down that rate of coastal retreat a little bit because it's helping to attenuate waves offshore. So there's a lot of models of coastal retreat rates and everyone's saying they're gonna accelerate and there's gonna be more mechanical and more thermal um, erosional effects, but you have to consider the shape of the shelf and how that shelf morphology feedback um, plays into that. And my current student, Caroline Cooper, um, who she's got three advisors now, she's at UNC. Uh, she is working on a two-dimensional cross shelf model in the same system, but of the Colville Delta. And so we were curious how the Delta morphology in this very shallow ice sheltered system might change if you take away the sea ice. Uh, so she was able to construct a Delft model using an idealized version of the local bathymetry. We've got some nice USGS bathymetry over here. They've got a good shallow water data set. Um, and what she found is that if you impose ice on the system, so she started with no waves. So if you just have sea ice, you can actually grow a compound delta, which is a delta that has a subaerial part that you can see, as well as a subaqueous bench that you can't see, that looks a lot like uh, temperate and tropical compound deltas today that are influenced by mixed energy. So I spent a lot of time working on the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. It has that sort of two-step compound cliniform shape. That's because it has a lot of energy from both waves and tides that sort of scour out that submarine platform on the delta. Um, we were thinking in the Arctic, it's kind of odd to see that morphology because you don't have a lot of wave energy. Um, but if you just have sea ice there, the sea ice reroutes the sediment so that you can actually form that compound shape. Um, and she is currently in the process of adding waves to the model to see what happens when you take away the sea ice but add the waves, which might be the future case um, in a few decades to centuries. And finally, um, I've got a current student at OSU, Adrian Heath, who is looking at very short gravity cores that we collected as well as some chirp data. Um, so we would like to be able to assess sort of multi-decadal to century scale rates of sediment deposition and find out where the hotspots are. That's really hard in a system where everything has been bulldozed by ice at some time. Um, so what we're hoping for is that among the set of cores, we'll get lucky and we'll have some cores from places that haven't been scoured by ice in the last hundred or so years, which is possible. Uh, we're also just trying to assess the utility of this method in the Arctic. Lead 210 activity rates are pretty variable around the world. Um, fallout rates are a little bit low in the Arctic, uh, so this might be a difficult tracer to use. There is also, there have been suggestions that the whole shelf should be erosional if the shoreline is eroding that quickly. Um, and we're hoping to sort of tease that out through this isotope work and see what we can learn about it. 
Uh, so he's got some good results that he that he's been starting on. He has found cesium at the surface. If you're at all familiar with cesium, it's not supposed to be at the surface. Uh, it's from the 60s. It's supposed to be a depth. So if it's at the surface, that means this is a pretty erosional system. Um, and he's also got some fun trip data that we're working on to look at what's under the surface. Okay. And I'm going to wrap up there. Um, this is an NSF project. We've received a lot of good support along the way from a lot of people. Um, and this is just a, a short list of some of the many people that have helped us do our field work. It has been a really fun collaborative project. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. So we're just going to bounce back and forth between questions online and questions in the room. So we'll start. Are there any questions online yet? Okay, so if you have a question online, go ahead and put it into the chat and we'll work through it. How about questions in the room? Oh, we can't let Emily off this easily. Thanks, Emily. Great talk. Um, when you're talking about the sediment transport and the direction and thinking about winds, it naturally makes me think about what's happening closer to Point Barrow and the idea of the krill trap and We've always thought that it's largely upwelling that brings krill up onto the shelf and then changes in wind that traps it on the shelf. But looking at your data, I'm also wondering if there isn't just some basic water transport that has nothing to do with upwelling. And I'm also wondering if that being a relatively open coastline versus Harrison Bay makes any difference in whether or not there's upwelling versus flat out transport. Yeah, that's a good question. And I'd be curious to look at some of the water level records from out beyond Cape Halkett, because in Harrison Bay, we do see some pretty significant setup and set down. Oftentimes, we, we like to think of that in a crash shore sense, but in Harrison Bay, it's really in a longshore sense, but you've got Cape Halkett there to sort of serve as a block on that. Um, so yeah, I don't know how it would change. I would assume there must still be some onshore offshore components. So you should be able to get some set up and set down that way, but I would assume it wouldn't be as substantial as it is here. Well, and just as a follow-up, Bill and I were just chatting, you know, it's such a muddy mess, even over to the West all fall. And it's ridiculous. Like you can't see a bowhead more than two inches below the water surface. And so do you think that sediment that's just being consistently suspended coming out of the lagoons or is it coming from the, the east? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's there was a little bit of work done by Mead Allison's group in Simpson Lagoon, uh, like back in 2012, 2014, and they tried to go do lead 210 there and they, they got slightly better isotope signals than I think what we're gonna get. But they concluded that the lagoons are actually pretty poor sediment traps. Um, even though there aren't many inlets and they're fairly small, there's still a lot of flushing that goes on. Um, so I know that you probably are getting sediment being exported from the lagoons, and that would be interesting to quantify. You know, I, I think we could get at that. But based on this, I'm starting to think that there's actually a lot of long distance lateral transfer from other sources. And people have hinted at that. They've tried to use, um, you know, clay mineralogy and some other tracers to track McKenzie sediment. And there is a little bit of Mackenzie sediment that's making it all the way to the Colville area. But you know, I'm starting to wonder if now there are sources closer to Ukiagbik like, like this that might be feeding into that and sort of keeping it muddy. You know, and you are getting some offshore transport here, and you might be getting more in the fall with gravity flows. So, you know, if Harrison Bay is acting as a bigger source, potentially there's a little bit of sediment that's getting moved across shelf, probably more so in the storm season than what we observed. But then all summer you've got this along shelf transport system that could be you know, slowly moving it toward the West. Hi, Emily. Hi. Um, has anybody looked at, or did you notice uh, when I worked up there, there always seemed to be two, or actually three very large gyres, one coming out of the McKenzie that would hit Flaxman Island and head north. And the other one would be right off of Cape Halkett and head north. And then, of course, at Point Barrow. And what I'm wondering is the one off of Cape Halkett, would that block any sediment from going further west? And this was, a, a, I mean, I would see um, scum lines going many, many miles offshore. So it was a, you know, and it, it's a, 
pretty strong current heading off of that. And I was wondering if that could be some kind of a current that would inhibit, maybe not stop totally, but inhibit any um, cross shelf further going further west. You know, I, th I think you're right. I think it definitely could. And I didn't emphasize it a whole lot here, but we actually see greater sediment concentrations at Cape Halkett than offshore of the Colville. That's not how those systems are supposed to work, right? We're supposed to see the biggest signal by the biggest source, which would be this large delta. Um, so it's entirely plausible that there's some concentrating effect near Halkett that would be blocking it from traveling further. Uh, I mean, in the future, it'd be great to go put a set of three small moorings just around the corner, you know, around the Cape and on either side. And we could actually track that. We could see if there's a block there. Typically in the spring, um, to the to the east of Halkett, there's no ice. And then there's this band that's probably four kilometers wide going straight north, and you can't get through it. Huh. So it's it's, you know, there's there's definitely that that current going around there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it'd be really fun to think about that. We would just have to see if the surface currents and near bed currents are doing something different. I just get... wonder if Jim Thompson had done anything. Jim's, his mooring is um, not by Halkett. So his mooring was a little bit east of our, east of our T1 line. Yeah, he had like, he had a couple floaters too. Yeah. At, that he would, uh, I know because I picked him up. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but he would leave him in the fall and then track it and that kind of stuff. And so J he was doing yeah. some interesting stuff. Jim uh, doesn't have turbidity sensors on those, except when I go out with them, but we're talking about a new proposal. So maybe we'll, yeah, we're going to try to integrate the turbidity on those drifting systems. Yeah, that would be great. Nice. Any questions online, Roseanne? Not yet. Any other questions in the room? Okay, hang on just a second. <laughs> um, in general, how does aquatic life affect the sediment flow? How does the what? Aquatic life, like plants and fish. Oh, the aquatic life. That's a really good question. Um, you you know we got we put a GoPro on one of our sensors and we got a lot of images of the seafloor down there. And you know I I talked to Bill a long time ago when we started planning this project and he told me how you can dive down there and the the seabed is really hard but it's not frozen. It's just really compacted clays. And we saw a lot of that with the cameras and it it doesn't seem very hospitable. We don't see a lot of burrowing organisms, um, at least in some parts of the bay. There wasn't a lot of biology in the cores. Uh, but I have a good colleague Julia Moriarty at Colorado who is a biogeochemical modeler. Um, and they're actually trying now to, to build on this and model the uh, sediment transport, but from the perspective of nutrient fluxes in and out of the seabed. So hopefully that's a starting point for learning more about, about the biologic interactions with the resuspension. Nice. Any other questions? All right, let me go all the way back down. This is where everybody in the room gets to watch cinnamon run around. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Emily. It's Sarah Hinkle. Um, so the really compacted mud you just mentioned, maybe that was more in Harrison Bay. And tell me more about the sand dollars at Icy Point. <laughs> how how far offshore did they go? <laughs> do, do you know Christina Gothel? I don't think I do. Okay. I was just at sea with her and she's a clam person and she, yeah, she wasn't super excited about the sand dollars, but she seemed to know more about their distribution. So she'd be a better person to ask. But we were really surprised. They tended to be at the um, offshore sites, so at the 30 meter sites, maybe 20 to 30 meters water depth. We were finding a lot of them on the south side of the shoals. Um, we were getting shipwreck grab samples, and man, the abundance. I think sometimes we'd have like 10 or 12 of them in a single shovel. So focused on the south side of the shoals. That's kind of cool. Yeah, which is strange because the there were little pockets of mud on the north side of the shoals that seemed more sheltered there. But yeah, we generally found them on the south. Cool. Thanks. All right, last call for questions online. Last call for questions in the room. All right, everybody, let's give Emily a thank you and hopefully we'll see you next week at Markham. Thank you.